We have a twofold moral purpose. One is moral purpose is one to make ourselves, to maximize ourselves, to be the best possible version of the human being that God wants us to be. And at the same time, and the other hand in hand with that is to try and make the world a better place. So we have to be doing both of these at the same time. Yeah. We have to be improving ourselves and making the world a better place at the same time. And I think every human has that obligation. And I think, you know, we could around for a long time humanity's around through most of the 20th century and it's like hey, let's have some wars and bomb some shit, and pour pesticides and everything and genetically modify food and pour carbon into the atmosphere and overfish and we were like drunken teenagers at their first party <laughs> just going crazy but now it really is every human's responsibility to 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 do both of those things need motivation watch your top 10 with believe nation Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because running the business is hard, and waking up every day and getting to work when you're all by yourself is hard. And the thing that saved me, that continues to inspire me, motivate me, give me hope, inspiration, ideas, is looking at the stories of people who've done a lot more than me, and I learn strategies, I get motivation, and it gets me to believe in myself to go off and attack the day. And so I hope this video inspires you to do the same as well. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Rain Wilson, and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two is meditate. Do you have a meditation practice? I do. I meditate every day. I keep it very simple. It's about 15 minutes, and it's just about quieting the mind. You do and it in the morning? I try to do it okay. in the morning. Sometimes I'll forget and answer a bunch of emails and get on a call and then like, ah, it's one o'clock, I'll mm -hmm. do my meditation. But I try and do it in the morning. Um, I think a lot of people think that it has to be fancy and has to use an app or have a mantra or something <laughs> like that. It really can be, and in fact, it can just be sitting at a stoplight in your car and closing your eyes for 30 seconds mm -hmm. to, to breathe. Breathing is part of meditation and to just quiet the thoughts of the mind because we are, and as another thing spirituality teaches us, we are not our thoughts. Mm -hmm. Thoughts are a helpful tool. They can be. Um, sometimes thoughts, you were describing OCD, thoughts can be mm -hmm. an impediment to mm -hmm. feeling of well-being. But my identity, your identity, our identities is not based on thought. Mm -hmm. it's, it's based on some other reality that is above and beyond and within and without thought. Rule number three is overcome your fears. When I got out of college, I was really lost for many years. Um, I suffered from severe anxiety attacks. I would get anxiety uh, attacks where I would be on the subway in New York City, like shaking and was afraid that people were gonna think that I was like a crack addict because oh. I was like sweating, I'm kind of sweating right now actually, but. That's more from the, the L.A. weather. But, um, uh, you know, I would be shaking and sweating on the subway, um, uh, panicking. There were days I couldn't get out of bed. Sometimes I would just fall to the ground. Um, these came and went for years. Sometimes they would be attached to a thing. So all of a sudden it would get attached to flying. And then I would have this terrible fear of flying. Then it would go away from flying and then it would be enclosed spaces and I would get it around enclosed spaces. Then it would just kind of randomly happen. Um, how did you, as an actor on the stage, how did you deal with that? That's got to be a pretty big trigger um, to literally be on stage yeah. in front of people. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, it was a big deal. I, um, I, it never happened on stage, but I would get that fear, you know, that when you get that cold, chilled ice water in your veins, like heart thumping fear, like, oh, oh, shit, this thing is about to happen. Mm. I would get that terror that I was on the stage because I did theater for 10 years before I came to LA and eventually did The Office. So um, I did a lot of different plays, a lot of different styles of acting characters and I was terrified that one of these days I was gonna seize up on stage, forget all my lines, and start shaking and sweating. Do you have and a then, guess as to why it didn't happen? Well, I think I think that it's like people who stutter. Like I have a couple friends that stutter and when they're acting, they don't stutter. They're Whoa. actors who stutter. So in real life they stutter. And when they're on stage playing characters, they don't stutter. 
So what is that about? There's a certain part of the brain that you're using. There's a certain consciousness and focus that you're bringing to the words that you're saying that um, I think allow you to not stutter and to not succumb to panic attacks. Um, But I was going to say, jumping ahead, this all came back years later when I started doing talk shows. And I had, this sounds crazy, it sounds absolutely nuts, but I started having a debilitating fear of doing talk shows. This is like in the, when I started doing The Office, the early 2000s, you know, this was, I did my first one in like 2005, 2006, between like 2006, 2010, right in there, when The Office was just taking off and I was doing Conan O'Brien back when he was at Rockefeller Center and stuff like that. And I would not sleep the night before. Oh. I would have night terrors and I would have a debilitating fear of freezing on camera, not having anything to say and uh, and just kind of shutting down and even stuff happening with my body. I had, so I actually, <laughs> it never actually happened but I would have to like work on my material. Talk shows are a really weird thing. This is different, we're just having a conversation. But a talk show with a live studio audience that's being taped, and then that, uh, what's being taped is just gonna be fed through, and this was back in the day when people were actually watching network television, (laughs) and there was actually one episode, I need to find it somewhere, it's in the annals of, of the, YouTube videos that no one cares about or watches anymore. It was like me on Jay Leno in 2008 or something like that. And I, I told him about my fear of talk shows and that my therapist wanted me to act out having a nervous breakdown on national television. And I actually did it almost as like a skit. And people thought like, is this supposed to be funny? Is this real? It had a little bit of a Charlie Kaufman edge <laughs> to it. You weren't sure what you're supposed to think, but I, I literally, went on the floor on Jay Leno's show and I was like shaking and like, uh, and I said, thank you so much. This was so therapeutic because I went through my, my biggest fear, which was having an anxiety attack uh, on a talk show. I have to see that interview now. That, that is crazy. Did it actually help? (laughs) Like, was there something therapeutic? Like, was it exposure therapy or, you know, it did help a little bit. It did help. It showed me the absurdity of like rain you're not going to be seized by tremors and have giant flop sweat and shake, you know, in a fetal position on the floor of a national talk show. It's just, it's not going to happen. Um, it didn't completely go away. It's not like I was magically cured after mm-hmm. that, but it definitely took a step in the right direction. Rule well, number four is find your passion. Should we be pursuing and following what we love the most and making that our purpose? Or should we be just trying to figure out our purpose? And then making that something we love to do. Oh man, you're good. Oh, <laughs> you're good. Um, that's a good. I you know because you just said you know acting's your biggest love. I think you follow what what turns you on the most. Um, you have to really make sure that it's not for ego mm-hmm. and not for self promotion. Mm-hmm. But you not find, to get famous or yeah to get rich yeah. It's like you can love acting, but then if you pursue acting for all the wrong reasons, you can really end up in a morass. Yeah. But you want to, or a musician, or you know, fill in the dots, or an entrepreneur, or mm-hmm. a businessman, because you want to have a house in Montauk or something like that. <laughs> like that's a very different reason than you have great business ideas. You want to employ people, and you want to be yeah. part of a dynamic. Solve ever- a problem, right? So, yeah, yeah, solve yeah. a problem. <laughs> be part of a evolving, dynamic, ever changing world, and. Yeah helping humanity move forward as a species, the seven, six, seven billion of us. Um, I think you follow what turns you on and then, but then you have to be very sensitized to that journey and doors will open Mm -hmm. and you have to be really like, you know, you hear that story all the time. Like I want to be a lawyer. I want, I want to go to law school or whatever. And then I was going to law school and, um, Dimitri Martin tells that story. He's the standup comic. Mm -hmm. He's a hysterical standup comic. And, he was in NYU law school and then he, on the side he did comedy gigs and he would go do open mics uh-huh. and he just fell in love with it. And just, again, little doors started opening and he dropped out of law school wow. to go be a stand-up comic. And he's one of the most successful ones in the United States. He just directed his first film and uh, he's just a great guy. And 
you have to listen to that that little voice and mm. those little proddings. And that it's almost letting go of attachment too of like yeah. what you kind of set out in your mind of like, I'm gonna be a lawyer. I already said it, so I'm gonna go do it and I'm gonna finish it and I'm gonna do this thing. It's like you gotta kind of be a aware and open to other things, right? It's it's letting go of the result of that. Yeah. Yes. So I'm gonna okay, I love being a lawyer. I'm gonna go study the law and then you've got to be open to whatever happens along the way. You right. take a trip to another country and you fall in love with that country or you, you meet a woman in that country and fall in love and yeah. then all of a sudden you're working for a nonprofit in that country with the woman that you love and using your legal skills right. in a different way and you've got to be open to what the universe gives you because I, I, I do believe that um, the universe, there, there is that energy yeah. in the universe. I know, I know when I'm in sync with the energy of the universe, I feel right. Yeah, I know that sounds very hippy yeah, dippy, but sure. um, you're in I, flow. I, I I do believe that that exists. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free there's a link in the description below go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business i'll see you there rule number five is learn to grieve it sounds like you had a pretty good relationship with your father right for for many years yeah. or yeah we did at least you were in conversation and yeah and so yeah. when you have that and then there's a loss or it's not there anymore yeah how have you been able to spiritually and emotionally cope with that loss physically you know it it really has to do with grief and and the grieving process which is not something we talk a lot about in western culture but it's just it's i had to learn how to grieve so you know this good year and a half after he died i would just sometimes burst into tears um i'll never forget my assistant just came by my office once and I I just had I'd seen some picture of him or something like that and I was just sobbing and my sister walked in and he was like hey do you want to oh and it's like it's like I'm like it's okay I'm just crying because my dad died and he's like oh, okay I'll come back I'm like it's all right I'm like oh, oh, oh. wow but you grieve so that you can go through you know and if you don't grieve and you don't learn how to grieve you get stuck and that's a good life lesson put that in your next Right. Look and smoke <laughs> exactly. it. But I think that there's a lot of truth to that. Like we have to, in fact, I had, um, I've been playing a lot of tennis and I'm on this like USTA tennis team and we compete and stuff like that. And I'm not very good, but um, I'm getting better. But I remember those taking lessons with this tennis teacher named Zach Kleiman and he's here in LA and we actually interview him in the um, Geography of Bliss show because we do an episode in LA and, and he said, like, every mistake you make, like, you, you know, you've got a clear ball and boom, you hit it in the net or something like that. Like, grieve it. Like, grieve the loss. Grieve the loss. The miss. The miss. Grieve the miss. Really? Oh. And he's like, feel it. And then you're through it. And then you're on. And then you're like, okay, what can I improve next time? And then you're on to the next thing. But if you skip the grief, I, you can get you can get stuck. You can get blocked in a kind of like a, a, a muscular self-will, but there's something about like, oh, I got it. I got it. Ah, oh, okay. What did I do? Oh, I took my eye off the ball or, oh, I didn't go low to high or I, I got ahead of myself, you know, just keep breathing. Okay. I got this one. And then you're back and you're, and you're ready to go. But his philosophy is, uh, that's to interesting to grieve the mistakes. Rule number six is speak up. Faith can be a very private thing for people. Uh, why did you want to talk about yours openly? I certainly do talk about my faith openly, which I'm a member of the Baha'i faith, and I, and I bring that up. This is not a Baha'i book or for Baha'is or about Baha'i, but I, I speak about that because I speak about my faith because it's a big reality of me. I'm also a Seahawks fan, and I speak about being a Seahawks fan. I'm also a fan of tennis and chess, and I talk about tennis and chess and Radiohead, and I love Radiohead, and I like to talk about Radiohead. So many people don't talk about faith for a good reason, because 
it can be off-putting to some and uh, it's a little bit scary or afraid you're being judged. Um, uh, and, but the more importantly is more than faith, I wanted to talk about spirituality. I wanted to talk about deep, big, meaningful, gooey spiritual questions. Because we were Baha'is and Baha'is are accepting of all of the world's faiths, we had people stopping by our doors and knocking, and we would bring in the born-again Christians uh, to talk about the Bible, and we would have Buddhist monks over, uh, Sikhs and Sufis, people of all different religious faiths, and uh, we would you know, talk to them about God or the, or the Bible or whatever they wanted to talk to. We, our, our bookshelves were filled with religious tomes. So these kind of deep, uh, wonderful, uh, profound, and sometimes overwhelming uh, faith-based ideas uh, really made the go-round in our household. Rule number seven is practice gratitude. Gratitude is the number one tool of positive psychology. And it's really the number one tool of people of faith when you think about it. Because when you're praying, you're giving thanks to the divine. You know, you're saying, God is great, Allah Akbar, whatever, however you want to look at God or the divine and saying, thank you for this beautiful day or thank you for the stuff I have or thank you for me being alive and having my senses today. So, uh, increasing gratitude is a huge uh, help in increasing happiness and human flourishing. Rule well, number eight is embrace vulnerability. If you're seeking greatness, it's super important to say, like, like, like you said, to try and be authentic. I was not always authentic. I was a bull artist, really, for through most of my life. Um, I was an addict. I was a people pleaser. I um, I just wanted to entertain. I was like the class clown. I just wanted people to like me. Um, and I was in constant comparison with other people. So um, that's something that I've struggled with. Really? And it really is trying to bring as much authenticity and integrity um, to my interactions as possible and to be vulnerable. Because if you want greatness, and I've just been reading and listening to your book and really uh, enjoying it. And I'm going to switch the, the complimentary tables on you and just say, what I love about your book is there's no bull and here are like takeaways. Like you, you, you want to do yeah. this? Here's what to do. There's nothing big in the book at all. Like here's hooks you can hang your hat on. And I just picture like some young dude trying to make a difference and your book is like a Bible, you know, and I, and I really, I really mean that. I've Thank read you. a lot of like books that are, I won't say that it's not self-help, but like motivational, uh -huh. like motivational kind of leadership, entrepreneurship or whatever. Yours is bigger than that. And I, and I really appreciate that. But I do think that when we talked right before the interview, uh, I was saying like, sometimes messages don't get through unless you're really vulnerable mm -hmm. and unless you're just as real as possible because there's a lot of those folks out there aspiring to some kind of greatness and some kind of motivation and, and leadership that, that are struggling Yeah, and they have character defects right. and they get sad some days and some days they wake up and they don't want to do a cold plunge at 6 a.m. and they <laughs> don't want to do a Tony Robbins three hour workout and a, you know, like a Mark Wahlberg 4 a.m. 4 a.m. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, um, protein all day like it, it, it's hard you know so i think it's important to talk about like the struggle so you you're leading off with the struggle well number nine is serve others seeing how actively you pursue um mattering purpose uh, i wonder if any of that is tied up in into getting to the other side of anxiety and depression yeah that's um yeah we haven't even gotten to the depression part but the um so my, my personal faith, a member of the Baha'i faith, has definitely inspired uh, this idea that we rise to our maximum potential when we're of service to others. And not only our maximum potential, but our, our greatest usefulness. And living in that potential and usefulness uh, gives us the most kind of rich human satisfaction. And I know 
for me, because I spent a long time when I first started getting famous, various points in time, just trying to satisfy myself and my ego. And, and I was miserable. In fact, they do studies on happiness, and this is part of the mental health, is you can, um, I'm sure you've had some happiness experts on, but there, you know, there's so many books about it, and, and the whole field of positive psychology is really exciting. Uh, field. It just started in the 90s. I mean, when I was going to college, there was no such field as positive psychology. Now there's thousands of books about it, and um, and they're they're really exciting. But one of the things that is um, 100% true in positive psychology is irrefutable that one of the worst ways to achieve happiness or contentment, whatever you want to call it, is through materialism. And yet we live in a culture that tells you over and over and over again, if you get this car, if you get this amount of money, if you have this amount of, of success, this amount of fame, this amount of um, a promotion, uh, then you will be happy. You will achieve happiness once you get to that certain level. And yet the pursuit of that, the pursuit of like, I need to make 165000 a year to be happy or I need to own the new Tesla to be happy or once I get this kind of girlfriend or spouse or whatever, then I'll be happy. The pursuit of kind of a materialistic uh, view of happiness is um, it has an inverse effect. It, it, it decreases your happiness. It makes you less healthy. I mean, you can do, again, I don't have the exact specifics on the tip of my tongue. It's a simple Google search. Um, and conversely, happiness, contentment, self-enrichment. In, I always talk about eudaimonia, eudaimonia. You know, you've probably heard about that and talked about that before. I think we spoke about it before. The idea that the ancient Greeks had a word for happiness called eudaimonia, which is human flourishing, you know. And I love that umbrella concept. Like, what creates the 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 largest human flourishing let's let's focus on that um forget happiness human flourishing but from the baha'i faith from the study of positive psychology helping others being of service maximizing how much you matter actually is the number one uh, uh, cause of human flourishing so um I just, when I kind of get into my shit of like, oh, I'm not acting as much as I should be, or you know, people only know me as Dwight, or uh, I'll never have a career again, or, you know, I need X show to make X amount of money so that I can go on X vacation or, or something. When I get into that whole stuff, which, you know, that comes and goes every week, um, it's kind of like, how can I be of service how can i how can i help people how can i take the skills that god has given me that nature has given me and put those to their best possible use so i let that be um i try uh, and let that be a, a guiding light in my life and we're gonna pretend the last one before some very special bonus clips is maximize your capacity a final question and i really appreciate you being here is what's your definition of greatness um, my definition of greatness is, um, uh, I guess that it, it, it has to do with capacity. So everyone has uh, different measures of capac capacity. We all have different capacities. Um, and I think that um, you achieve greatness by maximizing mm -hmm. the gifts that you were given and the capacity that you have. So... Um, uh, I don't know how to get there or what people's journey is to do that, but um, we maximize capacity. And one of the ways we maximize our capacity is by helping other people maximize their capacities. Mm. Uh, it's in being of service to others and upraising and uplifting and inspiring and helping others and helping them reach their capacities that we expand our own. We are human beings and human organisms that are living with a need for a support system and structure yeah. surrounding our mental health because we are functioning in a reality that is very, very uh, bizarre. Like yeah. our existence is unbelievable. You know, there, I, I, you know, I'm grateful for that awareness.
Yeah. Let's go back to your question. When you said, why wouldn't people take, like, wh why? what is that resistance to therapy? Yeah. What, what do you think it is? I mean. I, I think they're um, uh, fear and denial. I think that they're mm -hmm. afraid to face challenges that they might be having. And I think they're in denial about challenges. That what they do you think having. that fear is? I guess it's a fear of having a, a fear of being confronted about patterns, you know, mm -hmm. because a good therapist will do care frontation. Mm -hmm. And Ooh. Uh, what? yes, that's one I learned along the way. But a good care frontation would be a therapist saying, you know, Bobby, I've noticed you mm -hmm. doing X, Y, and Z time and time C again. Calling you out on your Why stuff. do you think that you do? Right. Like, that can, be, that can be challenging. People get very defensive, you know? And I think that defensiveness is something that should be obliterated. Why does anyone need to ever be defensive ever? Mm. Think about it. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video. I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 10 more amazing rules from Matthew McConaughey, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. I considered other careers. Didn't know if it'd ever work again. But after 20 months of being gone, unbranding as I now call it, being out of sight, not being in your theater or your living room in a rom-com, not seeing me shirtless on the beach, I became a new good idea.